So what are quantum computers? By definition, they are devices that store and process data by representing it using the inherent properties of quantum systems. They consist of a small number of fundamental components called qubits, which are controlled by really a straightforward set of rules, rotations of the vector that symbolizes the quantum state. Now, the most popular hardware or modality for the development of quantum computers include photonics, neutral atoms, trapped ions, and superconducting qubits. But the truth is, you can't build a fully functioning quantum computer that runs quantum algorithms in your home unless you have millions of dollars, access to fabrication and research facilities, and lots of dedicated time. However, having these resources, you would be able to build a simple quantum system and program it to run a few quantum gates. So in this video, I'm going to work through some of the modules of Q-Control's Black Opal and you can learn with me. We're going to talk a little bit about why quantum, why is it even important, qubits, and the physical implementation of quantum computers, and a bunch of fun facts that I'll tell you as I work through these topics. So this is an online interactive platform designed to really bridge the gap and make quantum education accessible to all. So now, before we start, pause the video, go ahead and sign up for Black Opal, the link is below, and you can learn along with me. And make sure you like and subscribe to my channel to stay updated with our quantum journey. So let's get started. First, why quantum? Now, I want to start with this topic because sometimes people have a hard time wrapping their minds around what quantum computers can actually do. They think that quantum computers can speed everything up. So just magically solving everything in parallel faster. And that is not true. And we're going to learn about why it's so important here, I hope. So let's dive in. Hey, now you see me in this new view here. So welcome to Black Opal. And this is a sneak peek at the platform and you can go see it for yourself. So in this activity, we're really looking at what is quantum computing? So as it says here, let's learn here, quantum computers are a new kind of computer, not unlike your digital computer. They broadly work the same way, taking inputs and producing outputs. But how they produce those outputs differs tremendously and allows quantum computers to solve certain problems, but not all problems, much faster than today's machines, with potential application areas including finance, medicine, security, chemistry, and material science. Now, I'm really glad they said that because this misconception that quantum computers can solve everything faster, that's a really big thing that people are confused about in the beginning. But really, there's a set of algorithms, and only about 50 or so, that quantum computers can actually do faster. Luckily, they're in really important problems like optimization, so they're useful to a lot of industries. And even here on the platform, they say exactly that. Why is quantum computing confusing or even controversial at times? The reason is the above phrase for some problems packs a lot of nuance and details about the very complicated quantum rules exploited by a quantum computer. But don't worry, we're gonna unpack that in this module. So now we match the representation of each form of data to the correct computer. And so, like I mentioned all the time, we have the binary right here going to the classical, but the quantum computer uses quantum properties. Yay, well done. So this section is called, what is quantum? And it talks about where does the quantum and quantum computing come from? So it comes from quantum physics, we knew that already, a new set of rules that some of these very small physical systems obey, and we're able to exploit those rules. I love this part of this module. Quantum computers are not mystical black boxes where quantum stuff happens inside. They are intentionally designed components of existing technology that work because of our exquisite ability to engineer and control the microscopic world. So use the slider on the right to zoom in on the quantum device which performs the computation. I love this as well because we're gonna zoom in here. Some people think this part is the entire quantum computer. Actually, it's not. That's the cooling device, the dilution refrigerator, and this is only for one type of quantum computer, the superconducting. But you zoom all the way in and you actually see that's the actual quantum computer itself. The steampunk chandelier, as I call it, that's just supporting equipment for the quantum chip itself. And as we get even deeper, we see a sneak peek of what's going on here, some circuit components that we're gonna learn about soon. Like I mentioned, quantum computers can solve a lot of problems, even though there's only a few algorithms that actually quantum computers can exploit. However, simulation is one of them. And it's really very natural when you think about it. So for example, you're looking at a quantum system. How do you encode data on it? Well, quantum data is pretty natural to encode on a quantum system. However, maybe a bit string is a lot harder, right? So here we're looking at simulation. So let's read this module. The modern world works because of simulation, which is the process of testing out ideas in a virtual environment before putting them to work in a real environment. Ideally, this forms the basis of rapid prototyping at low cost, which brings us to computers. And these computers can be programmed to simulate physics. In these virtual worlds, designs for buildings, bridges, cars, and airplanes can be quickly tested before manufacturing a single thing. But more than that, we can simulate stock trading strategies, autonomous car routes, electronic chip designs, and even more than that. We simulate anything we can because it's a cheap and effective way to reach good solutions. So, okay, they 
say, but why simulate atoms and molecules? Isn't that just something for scientific research? No, simulating molecules would lead to faster drug development, new materials for clean energy production and transmission, food technology, and a better understanding of the physical world. So this is exactly what I mentioned, right? We can really simulate very easily quantum information because it's very easy to encode. But beyond that, there's so many applications in so many industries for simulation and optimization. This is really the problem, right? We can simulate small molecules, but very, very quickly that goes beyond our computational reach. And it mentions here as well in the module, our current simulations of molecular properties are, for lack of a better word, fuzzy. Unfortunately, the nature of exponential growth of information means improvements in conventional digital technology won't help. We needed a new idea. So again, we can simulate exact small molecules exactly, but for bigger molecules, we have to do approximations. For quantum computers, we can actually do that exactly. So now we're going to drag the slider around and see the largest molecule that we can simulate with the highest accuracy. So as you see here, as we talked about, as this expands, very quickly the accuracy goes down. And this isn't just, you know, a fancy image and it's just going down. This is actually true. You can only get to a certain amount right here one, two, three, four, five, six, six atoms in the molecule for the accuracy. And then you can maybe get higher. So technically you can probably go up to with a quantum simulator, maybe up to 20, but even though that's still very low. So this is actually legitimate. With classical systems, digital computers, this is already getting hard for a digital computer to solve. Now, what is quantum computing actually good for? So I talked a little bit about this in my last video where I went through really cool features of Q control. So if you haven't seen that, go back and check it out. But this is really the key to why we're so excited about quantum computers. Yes, they can't speed up every problem, that's fine. No, it will not run doom, crisis, I've answered that question a million times, but it can do so many great things. So for example, it says here that designing new materials and drugs, we talked a bit about this about the simulations, optimizing transport and logistic networks, pricing financial instruments, managing risk in financial portfolios, and improved training efficiency in artificial intelligence. So really, these are really big impactful problems. This is a famous logistic problem here on the right called the traveling salesman problem. So you can solve for the simple instance of this problem by just dragging the slider around and seeing what's the most efficient route for the salesman. And again, you may think this is kind of dumb, right? You're like, well, it's between cities. You can kind of calculate that. But the crazy thing is, as the number of cities and the routes increase, this becomes actually a very hard problem for us to solve, even on supercomputers. And think about it, our everyday logistics network, our Amazon packages, our everything that we do in the world, our driving routes, uh, you have to go to a bunch of people's houses for Thanksgiving and you have to have the optimal route. This is all traveling sales zone problem. Robots in a warehouse, cables, routing problems, where we put electrical networks. These are all going to be affected by quantum computing. Now let's dig a little bit more into the qubits module. So here we're going to cover it from bit. So introducing the topic of information, qubit from bit. So introduces that quantum information, the block circle. I've talked a little bit about this before. Check out the last video as well. More about how do we actually represent a qubit and that information and putting it all together into the block sphere. And if you haven't competed against me in Race Against the Block Sphere, definitely do that. Now let's go into the types of data. So there are three fundamental types of quantitative data, analog, digital, and quantum. And these data types are quantitative in that they use numbers to represent information. Analog data uses real numbers, which changes smoothly and continuously. Digital data uses integer numbers, which can be counted and changed discreetly. And quantum data uses complex numbers, which adds a new dimension with sometimes unintuitive consequences. As in the special case of digital information, we have binary information, which is specified by the bit, represented as a zero or one. Analog data closely matches everyday phenomena like vision, which appears to have an infinite amount of detail with enough focus. But analog data is prone to errors. A photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy will never be as good as the original photo. By digitizing data, we can protect it from errors. So a digital stored copy of a photograph can be kept indefinitely and copied endlessly. However, digitizing data entails a loss of information. And quantum data, they say, is the best of both worlds. Quantum data faithfully represents the world at its most fundamental level. And while the data itself is prone to error, like analog data, with the right techniques, it can also be protected against error, like digital data. Nothing is free, however. Quantum data cannot be copied, it is single use. Once quantum data is read, it collapses and it's gone. 
So this goes back to the concept of coherence and fidelity that I've talked about. Coherence is the amount of time that quantum information is stored. So that's really important. It's actually very, very short. It's not like your computer right now. Computer data is just can be stored for forever compared to this. Quantum data is very fragile. And when you observe it, it also gets read out and is gone forever. Pop quiz. Is quantum data compatible with other data types? That is, can quantum data be used to store one or more of the other kinds of data? And I would say yes. Well done. While quantum data lives in continuous space, it's much more like digital data in the way it's used for computation, which requires correctable errors to do right. And randomness is really important in quantum computing. Here it says randomness is about probability. The outcome of a coin toss is the quintessential random event. The probability of observing either heads or tails are both one half. An unfair coin has two probabilities that differ from one half, but still add together to one. We can label the probabilities for heads or tails P and Q respectively. Both P and Q must be between 0 and 1 and P plus Q equals 1. This is the probabilistic bit and it is at least as useful as a bit. A quantum bit or qubit is very similar to a probabilistic bit but uses two complex numbers instead of two real numbers. We label these with the Greek letters alpha and beta to differentiate. The rules for these numbers require the notion of modulus but we'll worry about those details later. For now, assume that alpha and beta are real numbers between 0 and 1. The rule they must satisfy is alpha squared plus beta squared equals 1. You might recognize this as the equation of a circle, giving a nice geometric picture to a qubit. So now we need to rotate the qubit so that the numbers alpha and beta are equal. So we have a fair qubit. What does that mean? So we wanted to rotate right in between. When alpha equals beta, the qubit is in a special state called superposition, which we'll play with in the next topic. Now we can continue to go qubit to bit, but I really want to talk about the hardware. What does that actually mean? So now we're going to pretend we're on a journey to build our own quantum computer from scratch. So maybe not literally, but this is the spirit of how to build a quantum computer module. So we're going to take you behind the scenes, beyond the theory, and really explore. We talked about the qubits already. But wait, what actually is the qubit? We talked about it in mathematical form, but what is it physically? Building a quantum computer is first of all about constructing a qubit in the real world with hardware. And if we have a qubit, we can try to assemble many of them into a real quantum computer. So in this topic, we'll explore the various physical systems in use to make this a reality. Quantum physics is largely about energy at the most fundamental scale. It's here where we discover the energy is quantized, meaning it's observed to be discrete. These discrete values of energy are called levels, the steps of energy anything can be measured to have. If we have two states like this in a system that obeys the rules of quantum physics, we have a qubit. It doesn't matter if there are more, so long as there are two energy levels with a unique spacing in between them. We're good to go. So that's a fundamental point. That's why the qubit system is so confusing, right? So we have this mathematical representation and we're like, Wait, what actually is a qubit? And the reason so hard for us to say is because it can be so many different things. So remember, two level system, quantum phenomena. Now let's go a little bit into trapped ions. So trapped ions are one of the most advanced technologies used to build quantum computers. In fact, the first qubits ever realized were made using trapped ions and led to the 2012 Nobel Prize in Physics. An ion is an atom with more or fewer electrons than protons and hence a net electrical charge. A ytterbium atom, for example, has 70 protons and 70 electrons. An ionized ytterbium atom has one electron removed and has a positive charge of plus one. So if you take away an electron, you take away the negative charge, so it's plus one. It also has one lonesome electron left in the outer electron shell, a valence electron for the chemistry buffs. Even though sometimes I'm having a hard time reading this out loud, it's actually written so well. This is written in easy language, not too much jargon. So I really think anyone can learn from this platform. Now, if you're really into the quantum world and fascinated by it, it's time to take the next step. So hit subscribe, like this video, and hit that link below to get started with Black Opal. The first topic, so about seven or so lessons from the modules are free. So from there, you can learn how researchers tackle issues like qubit decoherence, error correction, and hardware scalability. And this education is really important for not overhyping the technology and understanding the real limitations of systems today. And games and quizzes are an amazing way to learn about quantum computing. So I promise it's going to be fun.